Thanks, Ed, for coming to speak with us today. You are the man behind the mammoth blog that is, what, what's the official name? Uh, Ed George's Reading Capital blog. What do you call it? Ed, Ed George's Reading Marks blog, it's called. And if you Google Ed George Reading Marks, just like that, it's the first thing that comes up. Yeah, no, it's a it's an it's a huge body of work. Do you want to tell us like what your inspiration or how you came to to start blogging? Well, I mean, interrupt me if I go into too much detail, but basically, the thought process was this: right, many many years ago, I read the texts that now texts by British, English, and Scottish two British well known people, Perry Anderson, Tom Nairn associated with the journal New Left Review, and they wrote a series of articles starting in the 1960s, which people nowadays kind of refer to as the as the Nan Anderson theses. And the Nan Anderson theses are an account of British history which accounts for what's distinct and unusual about Britain, England, which Britain, England is obviously, you know, a strange country, and, and what they kind of account for it by the fact that in, in the 17th century, the, the English Civil War and political settlements associated with that, which Marxists would refer to as a bourgeois revolution. It was an atypical bourgeois revolution that it happened very early. It didn't do away with feudalism properly, blah, 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 blah. And that kind of accounts for the strange setup, the strange, the strange political social configuration that you end up in modern day Britain. Right? And these are articles that go back to the 1960s. And that seemed to work for me, right? And that seemed to explain a lot of things about the British state and the way that the British state works. And that was, that was my kind of conceptual framework for, for a long time. And then at the end of the 1990s, I went to university as a mature student to study history, right? And then we studied, it's very Anglo-centric and Eurocentric history in British universities, but we studied a lot of British history in the first year. And the, the Nan Anderson thesis was a kind of theoretical framework that stood me in good stead, really, and made a lot of sense of the stuff that we were they were, they were trying to teach us. And in the second year, we did a lot more European history. And, and we did a bit of French history and a bit of modern, like modern is kind of French revolution onwards. Did a bit of German history, Spanish history, French history. And French history, no problem. Spanish history, no problem. German history, I mean, I knew absolutely nothing about modern Germany other than the obvious stuff of the 20th century. I didn't know absolutely the fucking clear about Germany. So you sort of, you, you do what you do. And I sort of went to the university library before we started this course. And you kind of, what you do is going to, you kind of dig out some of the Marxists and you find out what the Marxists are saying about things. And then that gives you a bit of a structure and a bit of a bit of, a bit of traction on the thing. And then it gives you a framework to work in. And I found some, I found some East German Marxist historiography, which was, which was terrible. It was real kind of Stalinist, dialectical materialist, crude, not very helpful at all. And I came across this book. And it was a book in English. The title is The Peculiarities of German History. And it's written by two... English speaking, one's British, one's American. It was originally published in German. Um, it's written by a guy called Jeff Ely, who's an American historian. He's also a political activist, and a guy called David Blackburn, who's a historian of German history. And they that was an intervention, it was a fantastic book, Peculiarities of German History. It's called Fantastic Book. And that's an intervention into German his, his, historiography. And German historiography in the 20th century obviously is obsessed with Nazism, because if you're a German historian in you know, after the 1940s is the one central thing you have to explain. And, and is one of the currents within German historiography was to account for why, why did this terrible thing happen in Germany? Why did this terrible thing, Nazism, why did it happen? And there was a current of opinion that said that, oh, well, you know, one of the reasons that it happened was that the formation of the modern German state under Bismarck in, 18, in the 1870s, that was, that was a bourgeois revolution, and it was an incomplete, atypical, anormal bourgeois revolution. And this, that explains a lot of things that happened in modern German history. It's a very parallel view to the Nan Anderson view of the British state. And this book by Blackburn and Ely demolishes that idea. It just takes that idea apart and smashes it to pieces. And he's Black, um, Ely's a Marxist, and Blackburn's a sort of Marxist song, and he's sympathetic to the thing. And it's a fantastic book. And basically their argument is this idea of, like, you've got some normal bourgeois revolution like the French Revolution, which is like an insurgent bourgeoisie, overthrows a feudal state, ushers in a period of capitalist development, you know, analogous to what happened in October 1917 with the proletarian revolution, you get an insurgent proletariat, blah, 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 blah. Right? And they just said this idea is bollocks. Right? It didn't even happen in France. Right? In France, that didn't happen. 
So this idea, on the one hand, that you have a normal bourgeois revolution, then other countries don't follow that model. And that explains a lot of things that happen subsequently is a false idea. And the fact that you can't even apply it to the countries that have had a normal bourgeois revolution, because that's a myth, right? And it's fantastic, absolutely convincing, absolutely convincing. Well, that's a fantastic book. So the problem I had then was, well, in terms of Britain, I was partisan of this idea that you've got this exceptional bourgeois revolution, which explains things. And then in Germany, I had this idea that that idea is, is like completely false. So I've got this massive contradiction that I, that I have to resolve. Right. So what I did in my final year at university, to cut a long story short, was to write a, write a dissertation investigating the concept of the bourgeois revolution in Marxist historiography in general. Now, that's online because in parallel to my Reading Marx blog, and there's a link on the Reading Marx blog too, I also have another blog, which is called Ed George's Other Blog, which is a very original title, but that's basically what it is which is very, very infrequent. And if you Google Ed George other blog, then that also comes up in Google fairly quickly. It's very, very infrequently updated. So don't go rushing there every week to expect something new. I write something new a lot once every two years. Now. But I've got a version of my, my, my dissertation, degree dissertation on that. It's a document called The Debate on the Bourgeois Revolution Re Revisited, where I go into all what I've just said, basically. So I got to that point, and that's kind of 1999. And then I thought, well, what I need to do now to kind of resolve these things, what I need to do now is look at the socioeconomic transition from feudalism to capitalism. And that's a, there's a, a number of historical debates that have taken place amongst Marxists. There's, there was one about 20 years ago. It's called the Brenner debate around Robert Brenner, United States Marxist. And there was a, a previous version of that kind of debate involving people like Paul Sweezy and so on, Morris Dobb in the 1950s. So it, it's a well-documented field of historical investigation by Marxists. So I thought, well, what I need to do is really get to grips seriously with that debate. But before I do that, I just got to sit down and recapital, right? Because obviously, a good chunk of volume one of capital, the, the primitive accumulation bit, is all about right? the transition from feudalism to capitalism. So I said, now is, now is the time when I have to sit down and read capital. So I thought, fuck it, I'm going to read capital. So I gave myself, like I said, I think I've said earlier, as I gave myself, you know, five, five years, I said, right, I'll sit down, read three volumes of capital, three was the surplus value and the Grundrisse. And that was my decision in 1999. Now, in 1999, I came to live in Spain, right? So with the complications, I've got to live in a foreign country, got to learn the language, you've got to get a job and stuff like that. I never really got going on the thing until about 2004, 2005. So I started reading capital, started volume one, page one, volume one, part one, chapter one. I took notes. As I read, I wanted to read it systematically, you know, I read it carefully, not worry about how long it was taking. And I was to write up my notes and like being, you know, kind of anally retentive, like we boys often are. I used to write them up nicely in, in, in Word as a Word document with footnotes and that kind of stuff. And in the end, I got the end of volume one and I had this huge document, which is my summary of volume one of Capital. And I thought and blogging was like coming in then. This is like that was when people like normal people like me were sort of people were starting to write blogs. So I thought, this I'll blog this. So I said divided it up into little documents that were chapters, converted them into PDFs, and then stuck them on the blog. So and then I started volume two, and then every time I finish a chapter, I'd write it up, put it on the blog, volume I carried on. And then as I say, you know, I gave myself five years for the three volumes of Capital of and the Theory Surplus of Valley. Uh Theory Surplus Valley, that was two thousand four, two thousand and five. And then last year I finished volume three. Haven't started the Gundries or Theories of Surplus Valley yet, but that's next. Right? So that's basically where it's come from. And then I get I get feedback from people who write to me every so often and say that it's been very useful. I get visits every day. I get, I might get, it's, you know, it's, it's well known, but it's you know, a minority thing, minority taste. I and mean, I might get five, 10, 15 visits a day from everywhere. You know, I've not had anybody from North Korea yet, but I think that's the only country in the world that I have another visit from. Yeah, no, it's an amazing, I think it's a really brilliant resource. Like I actually use it quite a bit. You know, I kind of, have been, you know, reading Marx and podcasting about Marx and interrogating all the arguments and stuff. But I've yet to finish some of the key texts. Like I've yet to finish volume three because I have so much going on. Like I can't even imagine what it is to actually write up in detailed documents in each chapter. You know, it's you must have thousands of pages of notes. They're really detailed and really excellent. It's a brilliant resource. I'm glad that you like it. I mean, it's a, I'm a, a lot of it. It's written for my own, initially, originally, it's written for my own purposes of self-clarification because capital is not, it's not, 
it's not difficult to understand, really, but it's long, right? And it's long and it's it builds on itself, is that you get something and then something else builds on that and something else builds on that and something else builds on that. And you've got to follow every step of the argument. And it's a very, very long argument. And people shouldn't be put off by the by the difficulty. It's not more difficult than anything else the Marxists write. And and it's it's a, it's easier if you're paying attention than a lot of things that actually Marxists do write, you know. But what you'll find is that because so much of it wasn't published by Marx in his lifetime, and it, a lot of it is drafts, and a lot of it is, is controversial, and a lot of it is misrepresented by people as well. That it, I found, I found writing writing up what I thought about it. Some of some of what I write is a summary. Some of what I write is an interpretation. Some of what I write in these notes are my own ideas, right? But I found it really useful for my own self understanding. And there were things in there that sometimes I. I, I had real difficulty understanding, and I, it would have been very useful to be able to refer to somebody else's notes and somebody else who had the same problem as me. And that was the main idea of putting it online: was that I know that other people, you know, you know, every day somebody starts reading Capital somewhere in the world, right? So putting and it's you know putting this stuff online helps helps other people. And every so often, I get an email from somebody, and they say, "Oh, right, I was reading this in Marx, and I didn't understand it." I love to your notes, and that really helped me. Thank you very much. And I'm, you know, that makes it. That's not why I'm fundamentally I'm doing it. I'm doing it for me. But it's, you know, it's nice to get that feedback. And it's really, you know, this stuff is there to help other people. Like, do you do you work in like hist- history or 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 like kind of a Marxist role, or is this no? I'll, I'll 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 give you a brief personal background. I'm 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 old. Am I now? Uh, fifty nine. I'm fifty nine now. My, I, I, I work as an English teacher in Spain. I teach English as a, as a foreign language. I have done for 23 years. I went to university before I came to Spain. Before that, I, I worked in factories and I used to work in the print industry. I was a union representative in the print industry, blah, blah, blah. Politically, I come from Trotskyist background. I was in from the age of 17, which is now 19, 1980. You know, I joined the then International Marxist Group. And I was, which is you know the, the the international current most closely associated with Ernest Mandel. I was in and out of Trotskyist organisations over the course of the 1980s and into the 1990s. And that's my that's my political background. My political background is 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 as an activist, basically. So I don't have a professional. You know, I don't have an academic link to this. I think I have a scholarly link. Alan Freeman, who, who, whose name crops up in some of these debates, he's closely associated with Andrew Kleiman, for whom I have a, a good deal of time. He, he, he makes an important distinction. He says that you know it's important that you know you, you don't have to be an academic to be scholarly, uh, and many academics are not scholarly. In fact, they they just talk bullshit. So I think right. that's that, that's my background. And I think it's easier to be a good uh, communist or Marxist scholar if you aren't being paid for it. You might, I mean, the quality, I feel like the quality of the work is probably negatively correlated with whether you're getting paid for your, your, your Marxist research or not. Well, I think now, yes. I mean, I think probably 30 years ago, you probably could in, in, in academia. You probably could work as a jobbing Marxist researcher, teacher. But these days, I mean, the shutters have come down. And, and since... Certainly, since the since the end of the nineteen seventies, early nineteen eighties. I mean, I, th- I don't think it's it's very difficult unless for the people who were already established at that time. It's very difficult to get into academia now and maintain uh, a level of independence of intellectual thought, especially in economics. Econ- economics, uh, the, the 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 non the non mainstream economists. I mean, if you look at the people who are, who are, who are Making interesting interventions into Marxist economics, they tend not to be economists. I mean, people like, uh, like that. David Harvey, for example, he's a geographer. You know, people are coming outside the economics tradition because economics was shut down in, in, in I think, 1970s. Really, economics was shut down in the 1970s, and it's it's almost impossible for people, very difficult for people to work in economics if you're not, an, you know, if you're not a, a mainstream, a mainstream, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not bought into mainstream economic theory. Like one of the things that happened with me when I first came to Marx and approached Marx was like, you know, the kind of incredible amount of internal argumentation about, you know, the transformation problem or oh. this, that and the other, under consumptionism or crisis and blah, 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 blah. 
And it was like, it took, personally, I spent like years interrogating this stuff. How did you interrogate all that stuff with respect to writing your blog? Well, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, fundamentally, you start with the text, right? But one of the things, the only regret I have, at least, I mean, it takes a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time reading Marx and writing it up and all the rest of it. The only regret that I have about doing it is not is not doing it earlier, right? I think there's a real tendency in the left tradition to not read the texts of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, whoever, right? Luxembourg, whoever, and just take other people's word for it. And there's a lot of that. And I think that I came to the conclusion when I started reading that the first thing you've got to do is start, don't start with what people say Marx said, start with what Marx said, and then look at what people say Marx said once you know what Marx actually said, right? And a lot of the, you know, what I call the non-transformation, non-problem, right? A lot of that is 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 misinterpretation of, of Marx. That once you read Marx, you see that you know the a lot of a lot of the controversy is not that controversial. A lot of it is misinterpretation, but a lot of it is willful misinterpretation as well. There are people looking. There is an industry of people for all kinds of political reasons who are going through Marx and looking for problems. Now, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, that, I'm not saying that you should avoid problems, but there are lots of people who go through this and they look for problems because they want to discredit Marx for, 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 obvious, for obvious reasons. Because ultimately, you know, I'm not doing this as an innocent academic exercise. I mean, I like the, you know, I like the academic challenge of it. I mean, it's like, it's like doing a crossword. I mean, you, you like the academic challenge of it. You know, intellectual time makes you think. But I'm not, do, I'm not. I'm reading Marx for a reason. I'm reading Marx for a reason. I want to change the world. <laughs> That's fundamentally why I started doing this. I mean, I was talking about the Nan, the Nan Anderson stuff. I was reading. I started reading that. You know, I, I became a Trotskyist in 1980. You know, and then in 1983, I was reading Nan Anderson to try and make sense of the political state that I'd, you know, become politically inactive to overthrow. Right? And I'm still doing the same thing. I'm still thinking the same way. So that's the reason I'm doing it. And I think I think you have to take the critiques. You have to take the criticisms of Marx that exist seriously. But I think at the same time, you have to not let the agenda be dominated by the people whose professional intention is to discredit Marx. You also have to you have to advance the agenda according to your own priorities, world changing, liberation priorities as well. And I think I mean, you know, Google, you know, you know, I mean, Google transformation problem, you know, and you get quantities of stuff. I mean, libraries have been written about the transformation problem. Why? Because it distracts people. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of this debate is, is pernicious in the sense that it, 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 it's, it exists to distract people from talking about, talking about the, the, the serious issues. I'll just give one short example. The Ian, Ian Steedman, who's wrote a very well-known book called Marx, Marx After Sraffa, which is one of the seminal texts of the Marx's value theory is wrong because he didn't, he didn't change the input prices to the output prices in the transformation problem in chapter nine of volume three, blah, 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 blah. Ian Steedman, who is a heterodox left Keynesian economists, friendly to the left, sympathetic to Marxism, sympathetic to Marx, wrote this book, Marx after Sraffa, with the intention of rubbishing Marx's value theory. I just, I, you know, I don't know Ian, Ian Steedman now. I think he's still alive and he must be, he must be quite old now. Right? So I, I don't know personally, right, anything about Ian Steedman other than the fact he wrote this book. But every time, and I've read it, right, the book, and every time I, I look at it, I think, well, why were you going after Marx when you there is so much in neoclassical economics begging to be to be cut down, right, and obliterated from and you know, deprived of its intellectual prestige? Why, why, you know, why, why, why are you going after Marx? Why, why is that so important? I'm very mistrustful of some of this, and I think there is there is a pernicious element to this, and. Too many Marxists, a lot of male Marxists particularly, who, you know, the, the kind of people, I don't know, who might play, you might spend too long playing computer games, spend too much time with the transformation problem and, and the mathematics behind it. And 
I guilty. think we get distracted. Guilty. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you can't, it's, yeah, I'm just not, it's a criticism, but there's a lot of social conditioning behind that. I mean, you know, these things, right, you can't help it sometimes. But I think there's a real temptation to get too embroiled in that, where you should actually be talking about other things. So, I mean, I, I read, I, I, I read the, the relevant material in Marx, I read the critiques, I read the defences of Marx, I came to my own position, I wrote up my notes on chapter nine, of which is that's that's the controversial chapter in chapter three with respect to the transformation problem. I think the chapter ten that comes after it is actually that's the really important chapter. Actually, I think chapter nine is just a bit of throat, throat clearing, but still that's what everybody focuses on. My notes on chapter nine are long and voluminous, and you know I I, I think I deal with it. I do at some point when I get time in the future. I'd like to, I mean I, I, I the, my blog. I mean I do revise my notes. I mean, as you read and then you read on and then you change your mind about things you read in the past, I do. I've started the most recent material I put on the blog. I actually put a date on it now so you can see when I actually wrote the notes. And there's some of the stuff from, from volume one, the beginning of volume one I wrote, you know, it's 2004, 2005. And now I try to put dates on stuff. So I do revisit things. I do want to revisit uh, my notes on chapter nine because I've adjusted my thinking a little bit. But that's how I deal with it. I mean, you've got to do it without, you know, and, you know, if you think the Marx is wrong, you think the Marx is wrong as well. I mean, you shouldn't be afraid of doing it, right? I mean, there, you know, there is, you know, you've got the real world, you've got what Marx said, and you've got what Marx, what people say Marx said, right? Now, sometimes Marx is wrong, right? Sometimes Marx is wrong, right? But sometimes just because Marx said it doesn't make it right, but you've got to start off with what Marx said and not what, what people say Marx said. Right, it's a real difficulty. Like, for me, like, you know, you approach... Just as a like, say, if you were to take physics and you were to look at like what a physicist said in 1850 and you would say, well, you know, you'd expect there to be advances or errors and stuff. And when when as somebody who's totally new to Marx and you hear about a transformation problem, you hear all these errors, you kind of go to me, it was always from a kind of scientific point of view. Well, OK, well, that's that, you know, I, I can imagine there would be errors. Sure. Like theories have errors. And then as I. As I started to interrogate it, you kind of go, oh, my God, what is all this? You know, <laughs> what is this stuff? You know, and after about two years of interrogating all this, you end up going, oh, my God, that's what they're saying the problem is. And you're like, you know, it's 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 very disappointing. But it's kind of like a, I felt like a moth drawn to a candle, uh, you know, and it, it's very hard. It, it, I think it's very hard that people come into Marx without context you know when when they hear about all these problems and it just it seems like a like such a there's so much literature it's such an insurmountable task to get your head around this stuff mm. i mean fun, i mean but yeah i mean i agree but the fundamental thing is read marx right and there are, there are so many people who know that marx is wrong know that marx is wrong and they can prove to you that marx is wrong when they've never read marx Right. Well, the first thing you've got to do is read Marx. Right? And Alan Freeman, I mentioned him earlier, he's, he's very good on this, and he's very strong on this. And this is, he says this every time I hear him speak. He says, read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, that I've called the transformation problem the non-transformation because there isn't a transformation, non-problem because it isn't a problem. And I just don't think it's, it's a problem, basically. I just don't think it's completely overblown. Right? But, you know, don't take my word for it. Go and read it for yourself. And you can. Anybody can read Marx. Anybody can read. We don't need to be an academic. I'm, I'm not an academic. I've got a degree in history, which I got when I was like 30, whatever it was, when I got it, 35, 36 or something. I work in factories. I'm a job in English teacher working in Spain now. I'm nobody special. I can read it. You can read it. You can read it. Anybody can read it. Read it for yourself and then decide. Then come back and we'll talk about it. But read it for yourself. Don't take other people's word for it because there are too many misrepresentations out there. And that's the real important lesson. Like I said, I mean, the only regret I have about reading, reading Kackle and spending nearly 20 years doing it is I didn't start doing it when I was 18. That's what I should have done. That's exactly the way I feel. I feel like I wasted 20 years not, <laughs> not being a Marxist. <laughs> it's my only regret. <laughs> so, like, the reason why I was at your blog recently, I was reading about something for perhaps doing an interview about something to do with Rosa Luxemburg. And there was somebody quoted a section on i think from chapter 30 of volume three where marx discussed under consumptionism where there's this quote that i was quite shocked at that i i hadn't read before where marx was essentially saying every crisis is of course an under consumptionist crisis and i was like that seems uh contrary to 
everything I, I had understood about crisis theory, to be honest. So do you want to like discuss a little bit about like, say, underconsumptionism and, and those kind of competing quotes that when taken out of context can really be confusing? Yes, absolutely. I mean, con- I think Mar- Marx's point, uh, there is there is, um, there is a quotation, so I forget, yeah, round about that point in chapter 30 something of volume three, where he says like, it's, it's, it's like the, the, the root cause of, of every crisis is the poverty of the masses or something like that. So you, you, you've got, this is, this is the, the, the germ of the idea of underconsumptionist theories so that basically says because the workers are paid so little, the works aren't paid enough, they can't buy back what they produce. And that's why you get crisis. Now, I, I, that's not my interpretation. There's, there's, there's conflicting material in volume two as well. And I think well, Marx's point there, he's saying, well, when you get a crisis, you can't sell stuff. And that's, that's what a crisis is, is that you, there, you get bottlenecks in the system. I'll, I'll say something about volume two briefly now, and I'll come back to what I was saying then. Volume two is the forgotten volume of capital, right? Everybody reads, everybody reads, well, I mean, I wish, I wish that was true. Everybody reads volume one, right? Anybody who's read some of capital, they've read volume one, right? Volume one is, 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 is the volume that's known, right? And volume three is the volume that's argued about because you've got transformation problem, decline the rate of profit and stuff. This is what people pick on and they decide the Marxist value theory is wrong and they want to prove it and so on. In volume two, nobody reads volume two. Now, volume two is, is fundamental, absolutely fundamental, because what you get, what volume two is, is that this idea that, that capitalist reproduction is, is circuitous and it's, 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 and it's continuous. Is that, 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 that you know, you, you advance money, you, you buy commodities, you put it in production, right? you get commodities out at the end and you sell them. Then what, what do you do with that money? Well, it goes back in the system again. So it's, it's, it's a circle. But then it's a spiral. It's a spiral because you accumulate part of the profit, and that's the way capitalism works. So this idea that the whole thing is a continuous thing, right? Capital exists in money form, and then it exists in commodity form, and then it exists in production, then it exists in commodity form again, then it exists in money form again, then it exists in commodity form again, then it exists in production, and so on, ad infinitum, right? Now, when you get a crisis, what a crisis is, is that that, that chain of events breaks down and stops happening. It happens too slowly or it absolutely stops. And basically at some point you get commodities that can't get sold. So Marx's point there, he's, he's not saying that the reason that you get a crisis is because you can't sell commodities. He says, well, when you get a crisis, the form of the crisis is that you can't sell the commodities. And that's what a crisis is. So just to take that as an explanation, it's a tautology. Because basically what he's saying is that when you get a crisis, you, you get a crisis. The question is to explain why you... Why, why, why you get that crisis. And it's not because, and if, if you read volume two, it's not because that there is insufficient demand in the system to buy back or to buy what's being produced, right? The whole point of the last part of volume two, the famous reproduction schemes, right? Mark shows that that's not the case, right? Crises happen for, for crises take the form of unsold commodities. But the reason that you get unsold commodities, there are other reasons, and that that's where Marx's crisis theory needs needs to needs to focus on. Right, because there's a quote there of Marx where he talks about that usually prior to a crisis, you have workers' wages going up. Yeah. So if worker consumption was the cause of crisis, then <laughs> the crisis should not happen because the the cure has essentially been taking place prior to the crisis. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's in in that part of Capital Volume Three. Marx is is going through. This, and let's. I mean, bear in mind this. This is the part of Volume Three, supposedly on on the credit system. This is the famous part five of Volume Three. That is the most underwritten part of of Capital, as is known. Right when Marx dies, he leaves Engels this mess of papers, Volume Two and Volume Three. And Engels is shocked at the at the state of what Marx has left him. When Engels publishes Volume Two, it takes him oh, look, is it two years or something after Marx's eyes, like something like that. He publishes Volume Two, and in the preface to Volume Two, Engels writes something like, "Well, you know, you, you, you know here's Volume Two, doo, 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 doo. I'm working on Volume Three. It'll be out next year or something like that." It takes Engels another ten years to work it out, right? To to put together something coherent from Volume Three, and and, and where he had the problems, and it's in the preface. To volume three, if you read Engels's preface to volume three, is, is that part five? That's that, that that stuff on the credit system. 
most of the rest of volume three was happily drafted and ready for publication in my opinion before Marx published volume one right? the stuff on the credit system where this 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 stuff comes uh, this this famous under consumptionist quote comes from that's in that part of volume three that Engels had so much trouble with it, it took him it took him 10 years 10 years eight years nine years something like that to disentangle and then he tried to rewrite it himself he says in the preface in the end he says you just like gave up and you just like basically you get in the end in the published version of volume three basically more or less what marx left which is just like a mess right and marx is in that particular point where the underconsumptionist caught that famous underconsumptionist quotation round about chapter 30 appears he's going through the business cycle he's going through what we call the business cycle this 10 11 7 8 9 10 11 12 year thing or boom and bust boom and bust boom and bust which starts in 1826 and carries on until until the present day and he's looking at specifically in that specifically he's looking at the reasons why that cycle happens and the patterns that it takes and the fact that you get these blockages and these builds up build up of capital gets stuck in a form right capital wants to move from money to commodity to production to commodity to money but it just gets stuck somewhere right and it gets stuck in commodity form people get like people get commodities that they can't sell and then you've got other people somewhere else they've got money that they can't spend right so you get these blockages in the system and that's what marx is talking about in that part of that part of volume three in in what sense now are people kind of dismissive of some parts of volume three particularly like the credit system stuff as in how how much the the credit system of marx's day differs from today you know like businesses don't issue circulating credit notes to any great extent anymore maybe big maybe big ones have corporate bonds that are traded in the market but like the forums are different is there a sense in which people neglect this area of marx because the changes within the capitalist system since his time i think people neglect it because he didn't write it um, and that's why it's neglected because that that part's not written. No, it's true. The forms of credit are, are different, but the substance of the credit relationships remain the same. I mean, in, if you you know you're a capitalist business and you I, I'm, you know I'm a business, you're a business, right? And I sell something that you need to produce something, and I sell it. To, I sell it to you. I'll give you an invoice. You don't pay me. You don't pay me when I when when you get the stuff that I produce. You get what? Depends on the country. Depends on the on, on the sector. You get a thirty days or sixty days or ninety days. If you don't pay me after 90 days, then I start writing you emails and saying, oh, oh, oh yeah, hey, you know, Tom, you, you owe me some money, yeah? But you, there's a whole network of credit and what happens, in, but that's as true in 1860 as it is true in 2023, right? Which is why a capitalist crisis, when they do happen, initially sort of take the form of these credit crunches, you know, the 2007, 2008 crisis. It was just a little thing, right? It's a little thing, a little subprime mortgage problem in the united states and then it spreads like wildfire because as soon as these the whole thing is built on chains of credit and once the system is moving okay it's okay it's not a problem but once you get little blockages appearing and the reason why blockages appear over the long term i think is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall right it, what it what it what that does right i was listening to you 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 were listening to your interview with one of the interviews with andrew Kleiman about this not so long ago and it's it's not the case, and you, you were discussing Grossman, Henry Grossman specifically, an article that Andrew had written about, about Grossman. These are extremely important debates, right? What happens, I think, when when the system moves into crisis and fundamentally what's the motor of that, of those crises is the, is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, right? It's not that the system stagnates. It's not that the system slows down. It's like the system becomes tighter, right? You can think of the system as being like a whole network, a whole mesh of elastic bands that are all connected to each other. And as the system gets tighter and tighter and tighter, those bands get tauter and tauter and tauter. And then one, then one breaks. And then one breaks, it destabilizes the whole system. And that's what capitalist crisis is about. And that's what happens then. And they may take the form of a particular, you know, 2007, 2008, in a particular you know, sectoral and geographical region where a crisis breaks out. And then the next time a crisis may be somewhere completely different. But the underlying cause of it is is the same, and, and and the level of abstraction that Marx is dealing with in capital that is as true in 2023 as it is in the 1850s and 1860s when he wrote most of this stuff. Right? It's as it's, it's as true then. The forms are different, but the fundamental logic is the same, and the forms of the crisis ultimately are the same. 
Yeah, I always remember when the, when the crisis hit in 2008, you had all the Irish politicians complaining about Lehman Brothers. They're like, if they didn't do Lehman Brothers, it would be grand, lads. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, like, I've been reading a lot of kind of early 20th century Marxist theorists at the moment for my sins. I've been reading like Hilferding and, uh, well, Neurath's not really a Marxist, but <clears throat> reading some of these types and doing some kind of study on kind of planning you know, socialist planning and stuff. So I had to read quite a bit. One thing that came up again and again at this time, as well from reading by Rosa Luxemburg, was these these Marxists had these theories of like crisis as a problem of disproportionality. I was wondering yes. if you could talk a little bit about that. And and, <clears throat> and where is this coming from out of Marx? Because it's not something to me that seems to be particularly something that Marx talked about, but perhaps I'm wrong. No, he didn't. I mean, I, but again, I think this is the unwritten part of Volume Three. The when Marxists talk about disproportionality, they're talking about disproportionality between the. This is Volume Two now, right? The, the end of Volume Two, the reproduction schemes, the chapters twenty one, twenty two, I think of, or twenty two. I can't remember the number of the chapter, but it's about round about chapter twenty. The last chapters of Volume Two, Marx is presents a model inspired by. The physiocrats, Kenney, Kenney's Tableau Economique, which he was astounded by Marx when he first read that. And he, he writes about that in Theories, Theories of Surplus Value. And he was astounded by Kenney's, Kenney's model of the functioning of the French economy on one piece of paper. Right? You can Google it, you can see it. There's a commentary, but the, the model of the economy, the whole economy is on one piece of paper. And Marx is astonished by this. And you see early attempts at the reproduction schemes towards the end of the manuscript from which the use of surplus value is taken. And Marx is astounded by this. I think he spends the rest of his life working on it. Right? Key conceptual, a key conceptual element of Marx's reproduction schemes is to divide production into two, two fundamental, what he calls various places and various drafts. He calls it departments or branches, one of which is where you get production of means of production, production of machines and so on, and also raw materials. And then the other one is production of what in modern economics you'd call finished goods, right? which is, which is means, means of consumption. So you get these two departments and disproportionality theories posit that these two departments need to go in sync to a certain extent because the, 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 the branch of production that produces means of production has to produce means of production for itself, but also has to produce means of production for that branch that produces means of consumption. So if that branch is not in sync with the other part of, of, of production, then, then you're obviously going to get a problem. And that's what disproportionality theories uh, are based on. Now, I think what Marx is doing, when Marx set, I think people are a little bit, sometimes I get the impression from what I read that people are surprised at the importance that Marx gives the reproduction schemes in volume two, because people say, well, you know, if you're, if you're interested in overthrowing capitalism, why do you spend so much time looking at, you know, explaining how it works, right? And why, I mean, the, the, re, the reproduction schemes, you can re, read them as an argument as to why capitalism is not going to break down, right? Now, I think what's important about that is that if you want to look at where capitalist crises come from, you need to look at how the system works when it's not in crisis. So any description of the system of how it normally works is, is, is a crisis theory. If you discuss crises, on the other hand, then crises are precisely what do happen when the system doesn't function. So any crisis theory is also implicitly a description of, of the system functioning. So I think that's the importance of it. So you can't look at crisis theories without taking into account what Marx writes in Volume 2, volume two of Capital. The disproportionality theory is, you see, the way I think about this is that in term, I mean, the, this, this, this came across very clearly in an interview you did with Andrew Kleiman about Grossman. Is that the, the whole Grossman thing is Grossman's, you can read into Grossman the theory of capitalist breakdown, right? And the theory of capitalist breakdown says well, if you just let the system go on its own, capitalism, for long enough, it'll just collapse on its own, right? Now, I think that that theory stated, as I've just stated it, is obviously wrong because it hasn't, right? because we're still here, right? 
And it, you know, the system is obviously crisis ridden, but there's no sign of it ever collapsing on its on its own own account, right? So capitalism is, in a sense, a system which enters into enters into crisis. And I think you have to be careful about what you mean by the word crisis. It enters into crisis. The crisis, the crises that occur, have have a functional role in the sense that. If you get things like disproportions between sectors of production or grand departments of, of production, then there are mechanisms by which the system writes itself. Right? Now, the fundamental mechanism by which the system writes itself is profitability, because capitalists produce in order to make a profit. And capitalists are driven by various mechanisms, not just to make a profit, but to make as much profit as they can. So if they're doing something whereby they make less profit than they could by doing something else. They'll go and do the something else. And that's, that, that's what they do. Now, that's the mechanism whereby capitalism writes these disproportions. Now, my hunch, and I can't demonstrate this theoretically because I haven't, I haven't studied it enough. It's one of the many, many pending projects that I have. One of the many folders in my projects folder on on the on the PC that I have here, right, is my hunch is that the business cycle, the 7, 10, 11, 12 year thing that Marx, everybody knows about, and all economists of all political hues, ideological hues, accept that it exists, and is understood to be a fixed capital investment cycle, right, the business cycle of booms and busts, booms and busts, booms and busts, starts in 1826 and is still going, right? My hunch is that that is the system resolving its disproportionality between department one and department two, right? But if you imagine that, if you get an overaccumulation in department one, right, or the, the, the department that produces means of production, so you've got too much means of production being, being produced, then the capitalists in department one won't be able to sell it. So if they can't sell it, well, they've got, they'll, they'll, they'll produce less of it. And they'll go off and they'll invest some of their money into doing something else. So the system will kind of resolve itself in that way. Just as Marx describes in Chapter 10 of Volume 3, right, transformation problem territory, what, why, do you get an equal rate, why do you get a tendency towards an equalized rate of profit in the capitalist system? Because if you get a sector of production where people produce more profit than other people, then people will move in because they can get more profit. But when they move in, you expand production in that sector. And if you expand production, you increase supply in relation to demand, the price will fall and the profit will fall. So you, this, 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 is, this is where you get this tendency, to, tendency towards an equalized, and that's Marx's, that's Marx's transformation. Well, these things take time. Now, I think disproportions between branches of production, fundamentally over accumulation or under accumulation in department one, with respect to Department 2, as Marx describes it in Volume 2. That's the origin of, of the business cycle. Un, untangling that disproportion through capitalists seeking a greater than average rate of profit takes time, and that's what explains the business cycle. Now, one day, I will write a paper where I'll demonstrate that to be true, but I don't know how old I'm going to be when I do that. But that's my hunch, and that's, that's what's going on. So disproportionality in that sense, the business cycle, I mean, you can talk about crises because you get this cycle of booms and busts, but it's not a crisis in the sense that it's terminal for capitalism because it's the cri that, that crisis, that level of crisis is an indication of capitalism adjusting itself to disproportions that naturally occur because capitalism is a system based on you know, millions and millions of individual acts that only get validated after the fact. So you, you never know. What's the expression? You, this leap of faith that you get when you produce something and you send it to the market. You don't know if anybody's going to buy it. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. You don't know. So the system adjusts, right, through the mechanism of profitability, right? So I think these cyclical movements that you see are, are the surface elements of that disproportionality resolving itself through capitalists seeking profit, right? The other level of crisis that you get, just to, just to say this, the other, level of, the other level of crisis that you get evidenced in people like Grossman and so on, the breakdown, is what happens when you get the long-term, for example, the long-term manifestation of, of a fall, of a fall in the rate of profit 
over decades, then you enter into crises where the system itself, without violent ruptures, which break out the level of the economic, I mean, talking you know, revolutions, wars, that kind of stuff. And I think we're moving into something like that at the moment, right? That kind of thing, that's a different level of crisis. But you get the, the business cycle level of crisis is just simply the ship writing itself, right? But it takes time, so the so and, it, and the shoots and over shoots, right? The, the the level of crisis that people like Grossman are talking about, a very important debate, right? Is what happens when these crises become more frequent, more severe, and then begin to provoke things like you see in world wars, fascism, dictatorships, all the rest. Of what happens then? That's a different level of crisis and a different level of debate. Yeah, like I, I probably have a slightly different take on disproportionality because I kind of feel like the market is constantly determining what the proportions are, you know, in real time, constantly putting pressures and adjusting the distribution of, say, capital from different sectors that perhaps sometimes it does go kind of out of whack. But I would say like this this is a constant pressure. Perhaps there are times when there is an accumulation, perhaps in a in, in a certain area, but the general tendency is profitability f- pressures first causes investment decisions to go down, which cuts that elastic band and causes a sequence of cycles down. That's kind of the way I think about it, because I think it's it's constantly the, the ship is constantly steering itself in, in, in little ways. In the edit here, I just wanted to kind of clarify what I meant. I didn't say it very clearly. So so this is a bit unfair, perhaps, to the answer that Ed is going to give. But what I meant to say was that in capitalism, there is this constant steering and determining of proportionalities. They're constantly getting shaped due to demand supply issues. Now, in cases of fictitious capital, we may see with pressures on profitability, we may see capital going into certain sectors that it wouldn't otherwise go into, such as real estate boom and bust type cycles. And once the profitability pressures come in that causes investment to stop, we may see then at that point a disproportionate amount of investment in, say, housing or whatever, and a fictitious capital being built up in that sector getting cleansed and a change in the proportionalities. But the point I suppose I'm trying to make is that the proportionality itself was not the cause, but the profit was the cause. And in a lot of the early 20th century literature of Marxists like Hilferding and Luxembourg, they hone in on disproportionality as a kind of a crisis causing thing in and of itself, that the disproportionalities are what cause the crisis, while in reality it's the profitability that may unveil fictitious capital in certain sectors which causes the disproportions to change, but it's not the case that too many shoes were being made. There was too much investment in these sectors that was essentially the cause. I hope that clears up what I was attempting to say during the discussion with Ed. Yes, I think, yeah. If, I mean, if, if you didn't have the, the long-term tendency of the rate of profit to fall, then the system would just self-right itself and self-steer itself, and it would wobble. It would wobble back and forth. It'll undershoot and overshoot and undershoot and overshoot, but it'll always be overshooting and undershooting around around some equilibrium point which would be stable and the system could could exist could exist forever but fundamental in marx's argument is that capitalists accumulate right capitalists make profit which is surplus labor right and that surplus labor they don't because of the logic of the system they don't just consume it themselves in you know, Mediterranean yachts and top hats and cigars and so on, right? They invest some of it and expand production, right? Inevitably, as you do that, then what Marx calls the value composition of capital, you know, of, of, of total social capital, the ratio of objectified labor, dead labor in the form of machines and raw materials and other produced stuff compared to the living labor, the people actually doing, the immediate producers doing the work, that ratio will change. And you're going to get, uh, over time, inevitably, Marx argues. And I think unambiguously, despite the begrudges, unambiguously, inevitably, he argues, and I think he's right, 
that you will over time inevitably get an increasing value composition of capital that you will on a social level you will get more more value tied up in machinery and physical things compared to living labor and that happens inevitably the rate of profit will fall and the rate of profit will fall inexorably and eventually the system as i say the system of elastic bands will get tighter and tighter and tighter as that happens and you're going to enter into the type of crisis not the type of crisis that you saw in 2000 2007 2008 but the type of crisis that you saw in 1929 for example in that kind of period in a period of global turbulence you get into that kind of crisis in which it's not a question of rebalancing the ship it's a question of turning the ship around right and turning the ship around requires the kind of things that you see in the the first half of the 20th century and which we might see in 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 the forthcoming period that's what happens then so i think once you take into account the inevitable and inexorable long-term secular decline in the rate of profit as a consequence of the natural functioning of capital to increase the productivity of labor which is what it does then it's inevitable that you're going to enter into periods of crisis in which these self-writing mechanisms then become in themselves destabilizing mechanisms. There's a wonderful passage, I can't remember where, where Marx talks about, you know, the falling rate of profit, like, and he says, like, the, the, the falling rate of profit is a description of the productivity of capital, you know, like, how, how, capital, how productive your, <clears throat> capital, your capitalist economy is, you can tell it by how low your rate of profit is. Exactly. Which is, which is incre- is a really counterintuitive way to think of it. Exactly. No, exactly that. Exactly that. And that is not, that's not a feature of things going wrong. That, that's inexorably in, built, built into capitalistic accumulation. Right? The capitalists accumulate. They don't just produce. They don't just produce profit. They reinvest the profit. They have to. But that's how capital, capital works. Right? And accumulation necessarily and unambiguously will lead to a fall in rate of profit. And that will now there are there are there are there are debates as to exactly how it works its way through. There are people who there, you know, there, there are fall in the rate of profit theorists of crisis. There are over accumulation theorists of crisis. I have sympathies towards the over accumulation argument. But I think which is which is which is itself a function of a fall in the rate of profit. But I think it's unambiguously the case that left on its own, capitalism it won't break down, but it will produce conditions of such social, political, and ideological turbulence as a consequence of ever deepening crises that those periods give people like me and people like you, I hope, opportunities to actually do something to overthrow the system. Right? Because the big dilemma historically that socialists, well, of all stripes, right, have is on the one hand how do you overthrow the system if you want to over the system how do you do it if you don't think that it's going to break down on its own then you have to do something political organization uh, of, of whatever character to to produce conditions under which you can overthrow the system but if the system is so strong that and historic the, you know the historical record is i mean how many you know how many revolutions have we seen in Western Europe and North America in the last 50 years? Right? If the system is so strong that us organizing as Trotskyists or Leninists or Bordigoists or anarchists or whatever, right, seems to have so little effect on the system, then what are the prospects for actually overthrowing it? And you've, you've got this constant dilemma in people's talk of revolutionary strategy between, on the one hand, people who, you know, the breakdownists who think, well, you know, not to, we, you know, we haven't got to worry about this because the system is going to collapse anyway on its own. If we don't, we now don't really have to do anything. Then you got on the other side, you, you've got you've got the voluntarists, if you like, who think, well, you know, the system is not going to collapse. We have to overthrow it ourselves. But neither of those strategies, I mean, the historical record seems fairly clear that neither of those strategies has, has worked. So I think the actual mechanisms future mechanisms or in the capital system lie somewhere between the two that in there will be certain periods within which the scope for human action allows you the possibility to 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 overthrow the system you can't bring those periods into being 
as individuals, as political movements, but you need to recognize that, you know, that they are there when they arrive and you also need to be ready beforehand.